this is my brother when he was still cute. Um, so, uh, for those of you who don't speak Chinese, the character for my surname, Ji, is for season. And with the addition of my brother to our family, we successfully managed that there was, um, to ensure that there was one family member born in every single one of the seasons. So in more than one way, my brother had completed our small family of four. He is an avid book reader. He is about a head or more taller than all his fellow sixth graders. So talk about gross spurts. And like many children in Canada, he had suffered through childhood asthma. So it's really around the age that this photo was taken, so around three years old, that he started to display a lot of these symptoms. Some of the most striking memories I have from high school would be waking up in the middle of the night, and there would be the sound of footsteps, the low murmur of my parents' voices, and this kind of cry coming from my brother. It's like him trying to hyperventilate and cry at the same time, so interesting sound. Um, but those were really scary nights, because those were the nights that my parents found that, despite regular use of his inhalers, he had really struggled to breathe. And my parents would find themselves, you know, jumping in a car and rushing to the emergency room so that he could get the extra dose of medication that he needed to kind of surpass that, you know, asthma attack. So I kind of already ruined the ending for this story by telling you he's in sixth grade, because obviously he's not in this photo. But this isn't always the ending for many stories. And I guess a chilling thought for me would be what would have happened if my brother didn't get his inhalers and the medication that he had needed in the first place. We're pharmacy students here at UBC. And through working in the community and in the hospital, we have worked with patients who are not as fortunate to access their medications when they needed them. I remember working with one patient vividly. She was a mother who came in with two of her sons. She brought in three prescriptions. Two of those were inhalers for her sons, and she had a painkiller for herself. Our team prepared the medications and ran them through her insurance plan. But when she returned to pick up her medications, she paused at the checkout counter when she looked at the price. She paused for several seconds and said to us, I think I'll just get the two inhalers for my son today. We realized that when patients encounter access barriers for medications they need, they have to make hard choices. Some patients have to decide between getting a medication they need or paying for that week's grocery for the family. The problem with access to life-saving medications is a growing global burden affecting both developing countries and also first world nations. WHO estimates that there are between 1.3 and 2.1 billion people around the world without access to medications. And in Canada, 1 in 10 people cannot afford medications. This problem reflects the flaws that exist in our health systems and policies. The flaw is that our current pharmaceutical model treats life-saving medications as private goods that can be monopolized. One particular story that captured the world's attention this September is Daraprim. This is a treatment for toxoplasmosis, a parasite infection that mainly strikes pregnant women and patients with cancer or AIDS. The price of this medication increased from $13 to $750 per pill overnight. And due to the price increase, many hospitals are now having trouble getting the medication for their patients. So unlike a lot of the other high-priced medications that we often see in our newspapers, Daraprim is not a new innovation. In fact, it's been around for 60-odd years, and it's been working well for people. Maybe the problem lies in the fact that, despite coming off, coming off patent years ago, there's still no other market competitor. Um, so what we're really seeing here is the issue of subjective drug pricing. And the, this drastic increase is not an isolated event. So if you look at the history of Daraprim, let's start back at 2010, where Daraprim was owned by a large pharmaceutical company called GSK. And they were selling this drug for about $1 pill. Over the next five years, Daraprim had changed hands about three times. With each change of hand, we saw a accompanied increase in prices and decrease in prescription counts. There was no input of new innovation or research or value to these drugs with each 
in price increase. And sometimes, you know, we see companies claiming high prices and justifying that by expenditures in research and development or in the fact that this new innovation will bring a lot of value. And this is obviously not the case. The sad thing is, this is not the first time this has happened to a drug. So in the past couple of years, we've seen this trend of increasing the price of generic medications that have no market competitors. And this is not just like Daraprin, where it's isolated to you know, certain populations. We're talking about really antibiotics and even heart medications for many patients. So what this really is, is a recurring business strategy to you know, increase prices of all generic medications to ma maximize profit. Why is it that there were no control system in place when medication costs raised so dramatically? And why is it that billions of patients in developing countries do not have access, and also first world health systems are also struggling to pay for it? As we've seen with the Daraprim example, the cost for innovation, such as research and development, and also the high value it has for patients, do not explain the high prices. The reason comes down to power. When medications are launched into the market, they are given patent protection. This means that there is no competition allowed in the market, and many companies try to extend their monopoly status beyond that patent term. This is also accompanied by a lack of negotiation power by insurance companies and also the government. For insurance companies, not covering that one drug because of the high prices can mean that it would damage reputation for the company and make that insurance plan hard to sell for patients. This means that most insurance plans will be forced to cover all drugs, and this brings power to the sellers. The power imbalance is worsened by the U.S. policy that the government itself is not able to negotiate prices, and it can only demand the best prices offered uh, negotiated by the insurance companies. This means that in the face of high prices, the government has to decide to either not cover a medication needed by patients or to take on the burden onto its already staggering system. And as we, can have, as we have seen, this is a system that doesn't really place priority on the treatment of illness but rather on a generation of profits. And I think that's such a sad statement because we're talking about human lives. So what can we really do as people, or maybe more specifically, members of our university to start, approaching, to start to approach this issue? Well, maybe the first thing we could start thinking about is to make sure that we're not contributing to the problem. Research, uh, uh, Universities, as we know, generates a lot of research, and sometimes that leads to the production of a new product. And maybe you could start looking into responsible patenting of these products. So what does this look like? Well, one of the proposed models is as such. So once a university researcher discovers a new an innovation, they'll be looking to patent it. And usually this is facilitated by the university's technology transfer office. Like the traditional model, this patent will be licensed out to um, perhaps a big brand name um, drug company in order to facilitate further development and research and to bring this, mar uh, this product onto the market. But maybe at the same time, we could incorporate terms in our patent so that we can also license this innovation out to a generic company that could go into low and middle income countries, um, bring forward this product, at a lower price. And these are areas that already have financial constraints and they won't, wouldn't have been able to contribute to the market shares of the original brand name company in the first place. The exciting thing is many students across the world have been approaching their technology transfer offices and university administrators to see if we could have you know, policies or principles to kind of negotiate this discussion. And we're really fortunate to be here at UBC because we're one of the first in the world to have jumped onto this idea. So our principles are called the Global Access Principles. And in essence, it's our commitment to ensure that our technology will have global impact. Really interesting for me was that they have a section in Global Access Principles that specifically mention fair access to the world's poor. So I thought that was really cool. And going back to the idea of a power imbalance, this really brings forward um, 
more power towards the innovators so that they could start thinking about, you know, who do I want to have an impact on with my technology and what kind of impact do I want to see? One thing to stress here is that global access principles are only the beginning and not the end. Because there's only a set of principles, they don't have to be applied, be applied for every single case. And due to the private nature of newly found um, innovations and patents, we don't really have any way of evaluating how, where, how well our technology transfer offices are upholding our commitments. So once again, we really need our researchers, so maybe you guys, to be able to be more passionate about this idea of, hey, how do I make sure that my, whatever I create in my lab will be able to actually have an impact on people? And of course, only a subset of all research really results in a product. So one idea that I want to bring forward to uh, for today is really thinking about what kind of you know, problem you're trying to address. What kind of impact do you want to create? Because this is not something that's isolated in a lab to do with molecules and receptors and all that magical stuff, but rather, like, how will this have an impact on people or communities? And then letting that shape how you approach research and how you carry it out, and maybe more specifically, how you're going to implement it. Another idea I kind of want to bring forward is the idea of having an open discussion about access. So as someone who works in community pharmacy, we often, um, too often, see this disconnect between our you know, intentions to provide the best possible care to patients and the patient's ability to afford it. So this is why we really need to start bringing the aspect of access and affordability into our everyday conversations with patients. However, this is not just for students who are interested in healthcare and research. When the uh, movement to cheaper medications are mentioned, people normally think about campaigns, lobbying to the government, and also applying pressure to the corporations. However, although these are very important aspects to bring change to the pharmaceutical landscape, they're no longer the only ways of creating change. We're in an era of technology and innovation. And change can be created when we leverage technology and connect the access to medicines issues to other demands and challenges in the world. This way, we can create solutions that are more economically viable and also sustainable. We're in a culture of entrepreneurship. Change is created when small groups of inspired people with different skill sets come together and build solutions with the resources we have on hand. We've seen the uh, power of entrepreneurship on our economy, on the way we communicate, and now it's time to see that same impact on the way we access our life-saving medications. I would like to talk about several innovations that highlight this idea. One idea that targets access to medication through leveraging the medication waste problem. Regularly, patients do not finish their medications. And to illustrate the extent of this problem, pharmacies are required to keep a bin that collects unused medications from patients. There are 10,000 pharmacies in Canada. There are 10,000 bins like this one throughout Canada filled with unused, wasted medications. And then the same wastage is also happening in hospitals, clinics, long-term care facilities. It is estimated that up to billions of dollars of medications are thrown away and destroyed in Canada yearly. And yet, one in 10 Canadians, that's roughly 3.5 million people, cannot access medications. The nonprofit startup Serum came up with the idea that built a digital technology and links the waste with the lack of access. Its online pl uh, platform connects the unused medications with uninsured patients, sort of like the Match.com or Tinder of unused medications. Its online platform connects clinics that serves low-income patients with donors such as pharmacies, uh, manufacturers, and also health facilities that has a surplus of medications. And up to now, Serum has helped access with 85,000 patients in just two states in the U.S. And now, moving on to an idea that leverages mobile technology and also big data in access to medication. This is a solution that applies more to developing countries and also emerging markets. M Clinica is an idea that founded in the Philippines where the pharmaceutical industry is fragmented. 
meaning that on one end, there are a handful of pharmacy companies that really dominates the market in terms of revenue. And on the other end, there are hundreds of independent shops spread out uh, throughout rural areas. The independent shops do not have a system of keeping track of their inventory in cells. And this creates a problem for the pharmaceutical industry because they do not have a clear idea of the market to base their important business decisions on. And this is where M Clinica comes in. It built a mobile platform that collects uh, phone numbers from patients and also their user information. And in return, patients are able to get discounts for medications and also receive services such as refill reminders. This platform leverages the drug company's need for big data on consumer behavior to bring cheaper medications to patients. I personally became involved and passionate about the access to medications issue through working with an international student group called the UAEM, Universities Allied for Essential Medicines. We have a chapter here at UBC. Through working on projects that push for more accessible innovations and treatment, I realized the positive impact that university students like us can have on patients that need advocacy around the world. The access to medications movement is not going to be solved by healthcare and research professionals alone. And therefore, this message is also going out to the engineers, the technology enthusiasts, the students who are interested in policy, big data, marketing, design, but most importantly, who are interested in innovation and want to create change. We're here today because you have the skills to tackle this very important issue. And at Terry Talks, we'd like to invite you to connect with the students here today and talk about how working together can help bring more accessible medications to patients around the world. Because your ideas are worth spreading. Thank you.